Thank you for joining us today. Proposed of today's uh, for, uh, forum is to learn more about Bill 219, the Life Settlements and Loan Act. For those who don't know, Ontario's law passed in 1930 prohibit the transfer of life insurance. In Ontario, over 80% of our policies lapse or are canceled. Death benefits is never paid. Tens of millions should go to Ontario seniors goes instead to multinational insurance companies. If passed, Bill 219 would modernize the Insurance Act and allow seniors to access fair market value for their policies and bring Ontario's laws in line with the rest of the world, like Quebec, US, UK, Europe, and Japan. Today, we have some excellent speakers here. Darwin Baston, President and CEO of the Institute for Retirement uh, Funding Research and former president and CEO of Life Insurance Settlement Association. Leonard Goodman, founder and chairman of Life Insurance Settlement Association of Canada. Paul Tyers, president of the Canadian Life Settlement and board of directors. Warren Horwitz, private citizen and former executive of the Canadian Life Insurer. The Canadian Life and Health Association, which has lobbied against Bill 219, was invited to participate today, but they declined. Today's format, each speaker will take approximately five minutes for their presentation. The speaker's orders today would be Darwin, Leonard, Paul, and Warren. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to join you today. Um, I've had a 50 uh, plus year career uh, in the investment profession. And in addition to uh, what uh, Rudy told you, I was also had the privilege of being the president and CEO of the CFA Institute. And I know a lot of uh, you all in Canada are certainly familiar with the Chartered Financial Analyst uh, designation. So, you know, thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, I uh, had spent uh, approximately 20 years in the uh, familiarity with life settlement industry. And I was the president and CEO of the, of the association, as you mentioned, for 10 years. So um, I've had a lot of uh, background and experiences um, that uh, have shaped uh, where I am today. I, I'd kind of like to begin, I think it, it, it helps us if we just say originally what the basic concept of life insurance was about. So it you know, builds from that. Uh, basically, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a financial contract um, that uh, provides for payment uh, of a death benefit by an insured in exchange for a consumer uh, to make a, a periodic uh, payments of premiums. Um, and if you go back in, in, in the history at all, life insurance came together in whatever form it did a long time ago. And basically, was its purpose was to um, provide a financial resource in the event of the untimely death of an insured. Uh, but the key aspect of life insurance had been at the beginning that the insured must die before the benefits are paid. Now that that's why it was developed, which is you know which makes all the sense in the world. Um, but um, I got to go to the next slide here. Um, so originally, uh, it was for the untimely to provide financial resources the untimely death, uh, and then there was a there was something that was added to it uh, when we got to ordinary life, and that is when we paid our equal premiums over our lifetime for the insurance policy, there were the, the cost of the insur actual insurance was less in the early years and greater in the later years. So uh, ordinary life where you, you paid the same premium built up an excess. And i.e. the concept began of life insurance as also a savings component. And as that cash value then built up inside, it allowed you an opportunity to be able to draw on that that cash value in case you needed it uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, and then of course, uh, we know that life insurance uh, in its innovations uh, developed further 
uh, because they had uh, competition uh, for, for, from other source, sources like uh, mutual funds and, and securities markets uh, that seemed to offer higher returns. So the idea then became, well, um, uh, buy term insurance and invest the difference in the markets. So the life industry uh, obviously um, answered that uh, with the whole idea that they needed to make changes so that they could uh, lessen, uh, you know, had to change or, or if they didn't, they were simply going to lessen the appeal that they had to consumers in the competition to keep those, those dollars. Um, Life insurance um, with its potential today uh, has a great opportunity to serve in the dual role that I think becomes extremely significant, but there does have to be some changes made. In addition to just serving the role of uh, providing financial resources in a timely death of an insured, uh, it also um, can provide investment and savings for the insured. The question is, how do we do that and how do we access that? Um, Susan Neely, the president of the ACLI or the American Council of Insurers, uh, recently wrote that America's retirees face a savings and income crisis, causing a critical need to explore alternative sources of funds for retirement and health care. And that's what we're talking about. And obviously, it's not just the squeeze uh, of savings uh, for, for uh, people in the US for consumers. We all know that consumers and savers generally are short uh, of having enough um, financial resources for retirement here in the US, especially you know, for healthcare. So in order to move into that role of being able to provide an investment and savings vehicle, what I'm able to do buy an insurance company early in life move along the transom of time and then have it, have it move into something valuable. But it must be transferable. You have to make life insurance transferable in order to give it value. Um, if you don't, uh, then a policy basically has no value until the person dies and then the people who access that are the beneficiaries. So I would just say that uh, here in the US and other places, when they allowed life settlements and they allow loans, they actually are allowing you to access the use of the death benefit of a savings and retirement vehicle before you die. And it's not just then left for the beneficiaries on this. So I would just say there is a very, very important role that can play and to do that, you should make it transferable, which basically you're trying to do with the bill you're trying to pass. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you, Darwin. And now Leonard. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, honorable members and others in attendance. My name is Leonard H. Goodman, and I've been intricately involved with the life insurance industry since 1963 in many capacities. Financial consulting being just one. I've actively supported the industry through membership in various associations and speaker at many functions. In 2012, I founded the Life Insurance Settlement Association of Canada for the express purpose of advocating on behalf of all current Canadian seniors and the many thousands, perhaps millions, to come to give them the right to treat their life insurance policy as a financial asset. No different than they are able to do with other assets, to name but a couple, real estate, securities, automobiles, boats, things that they purchased and all. In other words, having removed the personal need for life insurance as they have aged, they would be entitled to a fair market value of that policy in a regulated and transparent market. The generic term for such a transaction is life settlement. And I think I can hear you all thinking right now, well, that makes sense. I mean, why can't I do that? 
And indeed, if you lived in most parts of the free world, the United States, United Kingdom, Europe, Australia, indeed you could. In fact, even a couple of Canadian provinces allow you to so transact. I will digress and say this time last year, there were actually four Canadian provinces. Now we're at two, and how did that happen? Extensive lobbying by the life insurance industry in Canada is how. Take, for example, Nova Scotia, which implemented such regulations a year or so ago without any public consultation other than with the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association. CHLIA is known as a lobbying force controlled by the life insurance industry in Canada. And we at LISAC have had one-way dialogue for many years with CLHIA. And I say one way because all of our attempts to meet with them have been refused. And our correspondence, and there has been many, ignored. In fact, as recently as last week. And I will get to that in a moment. So I'd urge you to ask yourself a question. Why is CLHIA refusing to participate in this meeting, as you heard earlier, they did? And it's no secret. And it's the same reason that advocates, which is the, it holds itself out as the guardian to the public and with the thousands of insurance brokers throughout the country, also ignore invitations to meet and discuss these issues in an attempt to find some common ground. Both organizations answer to the life insurance companies, and it would appear that they view their loyalty as first and foremost to them. Although I do understand we did invite advocates as well. They declined to participate, but asked if they could listen in. If you're listening in, shame on you. Ask yourself another question. What is it these insurance companies, funded and controlled organizations, are hiding? Not wanting to debate in a fair and civilized forum where both sides of you get to air and debate? It seems so. And I'll provide some illustrations they do not want to face. In a recent letter to member of Cusado on January 22nd of this year, Ms. Murray, Vice President, Government Relations for CLHIA and others, opens with the following statement. Quote, I am writing on behalf of Canada Life and Health Insurance to raise our concerns with Bill 219, Life Settlement and Loans Act, a private member's bill that poses a risk of real harm to Ontario seniors, end of quote. Now, of interest to me on that opening line was, she says, again, quote, she's writing on behalf of Canada's life and health insurers. It would seem to me she should be thinking about the seniors. She also makes the following point, quote, there is no fair and transparent way for grading life policies, end of quote. Rubbish. I will leave it to others on this panel to opine with substantial evidence to the contrary. And I, I again, as I have for several years, challenge CLIA to refute its unsubstantiated statements in a letter I wrote to them on January 23rd, or excuse me, 26th, to which I had no response. Half a minute to go, Leonard. Oh, geez. <laughs> well, let's do that. Um, my letter states a lot of things, so I'm going to skip, and I'm happy to answer questions later. I will close with the following. Quote, so far as reasonable safety permits, it is desirable to give to life insurance policies the ordinary characteristics of property, to deny the right to sell except to persons having an interest, is to diminish appreciably the value of the contract in the owner's hands. End of quote. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of the United States Supreme Court in the case of Grigsby versus Russell in 1911. It's worth repeating, but I don't have time. So I'll just conclude my comments to say that should this body do what we obviously think is right and pass Bill 219, LISAC stands ready to provide assistance 
with the drafting of rules, regulations, ethical provisions to not only assure a well-regulated and controlled industry, one that will allow the voting public access to a free and fair market to their assets. I thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, Paul Tyers next. Well, uh, Leonard uh, touched on this, but uh, really this bill is nothing other than modernizing old legislation that was put in place in the 30s. And uh, you've heard a little bit, uh, unfortunately, Ontario is one of the few developed jurisdictions that is still dealing with this old legislation. Next slide, please. So I wanna draw just a couple of parallels that have been alluded to. And I use the two examples of your home and to investments and versus life insurance. All of these are assets. And most of us expect those assets as time goes along to actually grow. And unfortunately in the first, or fortunately in the case of the first two class of assets, because of an open market, people can realize the highest value because there are bidders and so on. And that's the case for your home. That's the case for investments. But in the case of life insurance, you're not allowed to sell that policy or monetize it. Why? Because this old regulation gives a monopoly right to the insurance companies to have a right of first refusal. Okay? That, ask, that option was never paid for. So what you can see here is on the left-hand side is that fair market value is the market that's achieved through buyers and sellers. However, due to the current regulation of section 115, that is creating a value gap and the only amount that is paid is what's called cash surrender value. Bill 219, as Rudy well knows, solves that value gap. It's as simple as that. Next slide, please. So I wanna just look at, uh, again, people have alluded to this, but we have thousands of seniors in this province who own life insurance uh, policies today. Some can't afford the premiums. Many would rather to, to uh, actually have some access to capital or income today, maybe more than the death benefits, because let's face it, they won't get to enjoy that. Mo most of all, what they need is they need the rights to their own assets like they do with the other assets. Some people, on the other hand, are very, have very poor health. You're going to hear from a gentleman later on who fits into that category. His life, he's got a shorter life expectancy, but bills keep coming in for health care and so on. He, they also want the rights to their assets. Now, if Section 115 isn't modernized, I can tell you if there are thousands today, there are many, many more seniors that are going to be hurt, baby boomers, of which I am one in the future. Next slide, please. So this is a live, uh, couple of live examples to show you how egregious people's uh, fair market value is hurt. Under section 115, term policies get no value. In the case of if you open up a secondary market, they would get 100% of fair market value because you've got a buyer and seller market. In the case of permanent insurance, they would get cash surrender value, which is typically equal to a range of about five to 15% of the fair market value. On the other side, if you open the market up, they would get access to 100%. Now, there's also the option of don't sell your policy or a portion thereof, but borrow against it as collateral. And you can see in the bottom, the term policy gets nothing now. Somebody could borrow up to 75% of the fair market value, or in the case of permanent insurance, where there's eligibility for 75% of cash surrender value. Remember, that's a small frac fraction of fair market value, but on the right-hand side, if the bill is approved, 75% of fair market value. Next slide, please. Now, I wanna look at two specific situations, and one you're gonna hear from in a short video. One is a 91-year-old chartered accountant. Now, CLHIA would have you believe that seniors don't have the capability of dealing with it. I can assure you that this gentleman knows what he's talking about. He's gone through most of his money in caring for her wife, his wife. He had a term policy. He had a no cash surrender value. He was able to get $76,000 to be able to care for his wife. And he has a couple of other policies that he'll use as needed. 
Second case, a 79 and 80 year old couple who came with their children because the children wants what's best for them. They just wanted to reduce their premiums. And in fact, the premiums were that much a year. Cash surrender value, $2,600. He actually garnered 42,000, okay? Now I ask you the question, if somebody's paying, willing to pay 2,600, somebody's willing to pay 42,000, the life companies have the audacity to claim that the people paying more are, getting to, are taking advantage. I'd love that debate. Next slide, please. We're gonna to listen to the 91 year old now. I need a My couple more minutes, Mar Rudy. Mar no problem. I'm a retired chartered accountant, 91 years old. And um, I'm the primary caregiver for my wife, who's 90 as well. I thought we would grow old gracefully together. Didn't work. About 10 years ago, she got sick. Usually, the wife is a caregiver for a sick husband, but I'm the caregiver for a sick wife. The cost of caregivers has eaten up my savings, it became a problem, and um, I looked to my life insurance policies because the premiums were very heavy, but I, I tried always to keep them going because I needed to make sure there would be money to look after my wife when I died. But here I am looking after her, I'm still alive, I need the money. So I went to the insurance companies to see if they would lend me money against the policies, and their term policies, and that was simply no. One of them had a compassionate loan arrangement, which they told me, oh, you're 90, you'll qualify for that. I didn't qualify. Doctor had to certify I would die within two years. So for terminal illness, there was a compassionate loan from the insurance company, but not for me. And I even tried um, offering my policy to charitable foundations that I'm involved with and I said you know give me lend me money against the policy when I die you'll get paid back and the rest of the money will become an endowment fund and I thought that would be appealing but the uh, charitable foundations had investigated and told me they couldn't do it because it would be trafficking in life insurance which I didn't understand at all <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> in the end, um, I was directed to a life insurance agent. Um, I had gone to my MPP because insurance is a provincial matter. My member of parliament, uh, really, I wanted direction to the Ministry of Seniors Affairs. Uh, I wanted to find out what help I could get. And he explained to me that uh, selling life insurance policies or borrowing against them was not legal in Ontario, but legal in other provinces, Nova Scotia. And I thought, gee, that's not fair. I mean, I'm penalized because I live in Ontario. So I supported him in a private member's bill to make it legal for life insurance policies to be sold. And um, the government changed, so the bill is gone. Okay, next slide, Shelby. My name is... Yeah, so I wanted you to listen to a 91-year-old. I spoke to him a short while ago. He's 93 now, doing well. But you can see that Bill 219 modernizes long overdue legislation. And I won't get into the other countries. Can we just... But it is opposed by the life insurance lobbyists, CLHIA and advocates, who quite frankly would prefer to maintain their, retain their monopoly. Just a little bit more to go. Now, one of the things that we did do, every, people were asking, well, what does CARP think about this? Well, what we did is we actually conducted a survey of the CARP members in December, 2020. And we asked them a number of questions. There are two of them. Would you agree that a life insurance policy is an asset of its owner? 80% said yes, a small number said no. Next question was, do you believe that a life settlement or loan option should be available to all Ontario policy owners as compared to the monopoly now 
of the issuing life insurance company. And no big surprise, the consumer said between 88 and 90% would like to sell the right to sell or to borrow. This is a consumer issue, plain and simple. Next slide. So just in su summation, the life insurance lobbyists, they state the reasons that, well, the consumers already have enough options available. And we would say, why would more options not that lead to fair market value not be a positive? They claim that vulnerable se seniors could be hurt. I'm a senior. Most seniors conduct banking, investment, and insurance transactions, frankly, on a daily basis. And Bill 219 calls for the same regulation to be applied as the life insurance co contracts that the people are complaining against. They also claim that large international companies will dominate the market. Well, unfortunately, they're dead wrong on that because the companies currently owned are 100% owned by Canadians. Next slide briefly. So I would submit that the MPPs have an easy choice. It's consumers rights, which is approving Bill 19 or maintaining the rights of the big insurance companies under current regulations. I hope we can count on your support. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. And now Warren. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I'm going to ask you for an extra minute or two, please. Um, I have to preface my speech today by telling you that unfortunately, I am in a tremendous amount of pain. I live with it every day, um, almost the last three decades. Uh, I'll get into that in my talk, but I just wanted to preface that beforehand so you can understand why I'm talking like this and why I don't look the way I would normally look if I'm addressing my MPPs, my government, which is the first time in my life I've ever done so. And it's that important for me to be on this call that I drag my butt out of bed into a shower and back on my wheelchair so I could be in front of you today. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to stick close to my notes because my brain is filled right now with a lot of pain. So why am I addressing you? The reason for that is because I come from the life insurance industry. I have a background as an executive for, for a company in Canada, and I know the arguments on both sides of the bill. While opposed by the main life insurance lobbyists like the CLHIA and Advocates, which is a strange name unless we're living in the Roman centuries, it clearly modernizes the Insurance Act in Ontario and opens up more choice for Ontario consumers like me. I have suffered from MS, a progressive form of MS, for the last 33 years. I've actually had to have brain surgery, um, which was very experimental and failed. I was supposed to have brain surgery again two weeks before COVID hit, but that was canceled. Um, I have fallen numerous times due to the MS and three years ago broke my back and five months ago fell again on the same area. So I'm in considerable pain. Um, I also have an allergy to pain medication. So I cannot take anything for this pain. The best they can give me is Tylenol or medicinal marijuana. So I white knuckle through this most days, every day, all day. And as well, the sleep center of my brain has been wiped out by the MS. So I don't sleep like a normal person. And sleep is a luxury that I rarely enjoy. All of these health issues have shortened my life expectancy drastically because not sleeping, constant insomnia, and we're not talking just two hours and then you fall asleep. We're talking, I can be up 
an alert and awake for up to 23 days before going into a psychosis induced by not, by not sleeping. The reason for me talking to you is the simple fact that you are my government. While Bill 219 might be important to most seniors, I'm not there yet. Quite frankly, I don't think I'm ever gonna be there. However, living on a CPP disability pension in subsidized housing, I simply want to enjoy my best life that's left possible. As an observant Jewish person, I also need to prearrange my own funeral as I have no family. I have no wife, no children. I have an insurance policy, but I have nobody to leave it to. So while I have um, enough subsidized income to live a simple life, I do have a sizable life insurance policy for my days in the insurance business, which I would like to use this asset to enhance my lifestyle a little and pre-fund my final arrangements. Why can't I use my own financial assets to solve my own financial dilemma? because a small clause inserted in the Insurance Act in the 1930s preclude me from using my own assets for my own benefit, effectively providing, providing my insurance company with a financial windfall because what's gonna happen in about three or four years on a CPP disability pension I'm not gonna be able to afford that policy any longer. And it terminates. I either eat or I pay for my insurance policy. Um, Bill 219 will right this extreme wrong um, once and for all, for me and thousands of other people like me that aren't seniors yet, but I bumped into them at my neurologist or at doctor's offices and we've struck, struck up a conversation. And they have insurance as well from before. I, I'll give you an example, a roofer who came off a roof by accident, also broke his back and was paralyzed from the waist down, has insurance, but what good is it to him? Can you imagine if I was buying a new Toyota with a hidden regulation enshrined in some government act, giving the manufacturer the sole right to buy my Toyota back at a price they calculate as fair? That is exactly what section 115 of the Insurance Act does to my insurance policy, prohibits me. And that's not fair and that has to be changed. This whole thing is ridiculous as we are forced to abide by a law from almost 100 years ago. Are we still in the 30s? I don't think so. Don't we want to modernize Ontario's laws like the rest of the world already using light settlements? Of course we do and we should. We should also enable loans against policies. And I don't mean this out of any, uh, I don't mean this without respect, but after speaking with other people like me with severe health challenges, as well as seniors who live in my building, all who want to use their insurance assets to better their lives, I find it cruel that my government won't allow this. I have been following this life settlement industry since it popped up on the earth approximately 25 years ago. So this is a very important tool that we need. People like me, seniors maybe, um, other people may be in a financial situation. So I'm asking you to do the right thing and please pass Bill 219. Don't be hoodwinked by the life insurance advocates and CLHIA I'm gonna say the word garbage because that's what it is. I've known them for a long time. And when I was in the industry as an executive, I had my bouts with them as well. And again, they would never show up to a table. So I'm gonna just briefly finish right here. 
they're giving you false narratives and who they say they're looking out for seniors when it's transparently the interest of the large insurance industry companies interest that they are protecting not you and i and that has to change you're my government i need help from you now because i don't have much longer and i need the help so I'm asking you to please pass Bill 219 right now. Thank you very much. I guess they say they always save the best for last. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. And it's true, we did save the best for last. Okay, so I have a few questions I've been getting here. Um, uh, this one would be for Paul. I've heard that life settlements can take advantage of seniors. Can you speak to uh, to this particular uh, on fraud on this? Well, you know, this has been brought up. I brought it up a little bit in mind, but um, uh, I speak as a senior and uh, I think most seniors are conducting business on a day to day basis in most financial transactions. Um, and this bill actually went beyond that because it actually built in what's called a cooling off period, okay? Uh, that cooling off period doesn't even exist in the, in the life insurance sales business, so it went beyond that. But to me, the most important thing, Rudy, is what you insisted on, and that was that this be subject to the same regulations as the insurance contracts. And so it's a false narrative, but it's a convenient one. So I, I, that's how I would answer that. Uh, thank you, Paul. I, I think I have a question here for Darwin. Would this make the cost of life insurance go up for the consumer? I have to take your uh, hearing I'm off. I'm mute. Got it. Thank you. Um, really, I don't believe there is any evidence that we can point to that says that the presence of uh, the life settlement option uh, or would even the loan option, would cause premiums to go up. Now, there has been some cost of insurance premiums that have been raised in the U.S. by certain companies, but that was done basically because they mispriced a product in the beginning. We've had extremely low interest rates, and when they raise uh, cost of insurance, that, that's one way that they can make up that profit gap uh, that they've created for themselves. But as it relates strictly to the sale of life settlements, uh, there, ju there just has not been and will not be that many sales that it's going to impact or, or, or affect, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the cost of, of, of any premiums or, or whatever the case might be. Uh, I, I, I'd just like to make one comment, a follow up of what Paul said. You all as an industry, as a life settlement industry and deal in it, uh, you have the opportunity to go beyond at some point uh, when this law is passed, uh, the requirements, and I would urge you all to encourage all the firms involved to, to have a lot of transparency and disclosures, because if there's anything that kills an objection to some particular product, it's just to be total open and transparent and fully disclosed to the consumers. This is a consumer this is a consumer right, at least we feel that way here. Uh, and it's, a, it's, an, it's an opportunity for people to help better the seniors. It is, a, it, it, it is something that helps both seniors and it'll help the life companies. The 15 years that I've been involved deeply in this business uh, and when I was with Lisa, in the early years, we, we went, had to go to every state to get them to approve it, to get them to accept the whole idea and whatnot. Over time, they've accepted the idea that, okay, they're here. Uh, in fact, I, I, I think they, I, I think they are, are, are less opposed today than ever because they see it as an advantage that they can give to consumers and probably an obligation to do that. Look, uh, they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the consumers buying the product. Thank you, Darwin. Really, appreciate I, another question I have here. What are some reasons people would want to lapse their policy? Uh, is Leonard around here? He's on mute, I believe. Is that better? Yep. There he is. I can't see me, but can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
I'm sorry, say the question again, please. What are some reasons people would want to lapse their policy? Well, first, I object to the word lapse. I'd rather say surrender. Um, and the reason I say surrender is because by definition, so if you have to surrender something, you have it means you're captive in the first place. So <laughs> let's dispose of lapse. But the reason people would terminate or want to walk away from a life policy, there are a number of reasons. Uh, the obvious reason is that there's no further use. You buy the policy at age 20, you navigate through life, you get to 80 or 70 and everybody's gone. The reason you bought it is non-existent. I don't need the policy. Alternatively, I could use it, but I can't afford it. And I need to pay for health care. I need to, I'd like to travel. Um, my kids are all grown up and I, 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 I canvass my kids and say, Dad, we don't want your life insurance. We're okay. You use it for your benefit. So in substance, it's to use it for the same reason that you would use any other asset. Self-improvement of lifestyle in most cases. Rudy, if, if, if there was an alternative to give that policy value before the person dies and it's only values a death benefit, they would seriously consider not lapping or at least how they might, you know, get the equity value out of that policy rather than, you know, rather than just giving it up. Uh, but up till now, if lapses, you know, if, if you can't do it for anything else, why do you just um, let it go back? If I can inject a comment, Unless you, uh, Rudy, I, you have not a question you want to put on the table? Yeah, go, go ahead. Well, well, there's a couple right, more questions. I can questions. inject a comment about um, the value. My experience, and it's been well over 50 years, is that a member of the public will buy life insurance for the traditional reasons. And they will say, ah, what's the least I can get away with? Um, however, if you say to that same member of the public, listen, I got, I got a good deal for you. You can buy this coverage and use it throughout the years. And when time comes, if it does, if you haven't died and you want to rid yourself of this policy, you can go to an open market and get fair market value. I would suggest to you that consumer will buy twice as much. Uh, another question here, this one is for Paul. Um, how much fraud has there been in uh, life settlements uh, through Canada and the US and worldwide? Well, um, it's interesting you ask that because uh, I was a member of Lisa in the US and the, uh, I was provided information from the National Association of um, Insurance Regulators and they actually keep tabs on complaints uh, throughout the years. And so over a five year span ending in 2018, uh, there was one life settlement complaint when on average there was 25,000 formal complaints in any given year. One life settlement complaint, all of the others were against the very life insurance companies or their agents. So I would submit to you that while people may claim this is a big problem in the US, it hasn't proven out using those statistics. In the Canadian market, I had a discussion uh, with uh, in Quebec and I've asked that question of the regulators in the provinces where it actually is allowed to operate. And they told me that they're not aware of one formal complaint that's been made. And so again, a spurious argument by the people who are opposed, in my opinion. Paul, you're speaking about complaints uh, by uh, the consumer, right? That's uh, correct. When people have seen a lot about fraud out there, the fraud is, is, is on the investment side uh, and it's not on the consumer side of getting, uh, you know, having been frauded because of selling their policy. Right. I have another question here, it's for Paul again. If there is a policyholder who owns 
the policy for 12 years, then transfers the ownership and beneficiary to an Ontario numbered company with the sole shareholder being the same with the 24 month proposed proposal still be in force on or would the combined ownership by the same person render the 24 month holding period? Okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's a technical question about life insurance. And the 24 month period that they're referring to, uh, I believe is um, basically insurable interest. And that insurable interest has been proven to only apply within the first 24 months of the policy actually being uh, acquired to begin with. So just to answer that person's question, over the last several years, there have been numerous policies move from personal ownership into companies. And there's, I'm a CA by profession as well, and there's a real tax advantage to do that. So they're sort of putting two issues together. The point is there are no restrictions of this 24 month because it's within 24 months of the policy and uh, somebody could do that today uh, to answer that question. There's another question as well. Um, it could be to any one of you, uh, Paul, Darwin, uh, Leonard, why would the insurance companies be against the best interest of our seniors? Leonard, do you want to try to take that? It's a, clearly a Canadian question. Well, if, if not, let me, let me take that. Um, I believe that there's quite frankly, uh, there's this fear. Am I, am I cut off? Go ahead, Leonard. Go ahead. Take, no, you can I don't know. This. I was in the middle and some, somebody went mute. <laughs> Who's answering? Go ahead, Leonard. I get the question. Why, why would the insurance companies be against the best interest of our seniors? I don't think they are necessarily. But their motivation to oppose is predicated basically on dollars and cents. Insurance is a made up of statistics. And statistically, and the insurance companies never will divulge their formulas, but statistically, they know how many people of a specific age and health bracket will die in year one, two, three, four, on and on and on. Okay. They also know statistically that four out of five policies that they sell today will never reach a point of claim while still in force. Now, that's a known statistic proven by various uh, uh, um, statistical analysts. They also know that if the life settlement industry, if uh, ABC Life Settlements Inc. buys Paul's policy for say a million dollars, not going to surrender that policy. It's not going to terminate that policy. It's going to keep it until he dies. And therefore they're obligated to retain it on the books, pay the claim. If it's lapsed or terminated, it comes off the books and it further reduces their requirements for reserves. So it's strictly a numbers game with the numbers going to the industry and not to the seniors. One more question here. How many seniors would take advantage of this life settlement uh, asset? Well, I don't believe that there are any, there's any way to predetermine that. Uh, but I do think that a market in the U.S. might be a good proxy uh, for that because this industry has operated for over 25 years. I wonder, Darwin, if you have any sense about of that in the U.S. market that's already been operated for that many years. Well, uh, I, I, I can say that uh, it is directly related to our ability to educate and get seniors and their advisors to understand the value that may be in the life policy so that they can, you know, uh, in, include that in managing of their funds. There's 9 million seniors in the United States. 
that own life insurance uh, over age 75, that own life insurance that has a face value of about $1.5 trillion. Um, the life settlement market in the U.S. is, uh, you know, give or, give or take, uh, you know, four, say $4 billion a year. Um, it's going to take a lot of years for the life settlement business to become so dominant that it's going to cause the uh, harm that insurance companies claim that it's going to have on them and hurt their, their earnings. I'd like to say one quick thing about lapses. Often in the US, they say that 90% of the life insurance policies never pay a death benefit. That's correct. But it is in the single digits, the policies that lapse by seniors over the age of 70 to 75. So when they say that the insurance uh, industry is concerned about all the lapses and all that pricing you know, impact of lapses, the fact is there is not that many that lapse. Uh, someone made a comment a little earlier about the potential for um, insurance um, uh, companies to actually grow their own business if they simply would allow their seniors to be able to use it to increase their equity that they have available to them uh, to use in their retirement years by the sale of it or by taking a loan out against it. So only two there's two places where there's a, where illiquid equity in the US by seniors. One is in their homes and they do reverse mortgage to take care of that. And that's a personal asset. And the other is a life insurance policy. And that's a personal asset been declared for that. So why shouldn't they be able to take advantage of the equity that would build up in that? And it all goes back to the fact that they made it transferable by the 1911 um, Supreme Court uh, 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 decision that, that Len um, uh, said about, about the, you know, the, the fact that it's personal property. It will only cause, it will only cause everyone to benefit. It is not going to do harm to the insurance industry. Thank you, Darwin. One more question here. What would be the targeted IRR that the secondary market would be pricing the UL100 policy, assuming there is an agreement on this life? Um, I'll, I'll say what I think it is related here, and it's probably not that much different. Um, they're discounted at somewhere between say 13 and 15%. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's what the act, you know, and, and, and they would experience that return if people died when they predicted or thought they would at their estimated life expectancy. Obviously people live longer. Um, and, and as we, we discover that life expectancies do uh, increase over time, um, there is, the probability that you can still get a double digit return is probably very high. But that is if you accumulate a portfolio of hundred or several hundred policies. I think AMS did a study years ago that said you needed about 300 policies in a portfolio to mitigate the risk of, of life expectancies, not performing like you expect them to. So it's a very attractive asset class for, 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 a, lot of, for a lot of people. And I think that's why the demand is so great in the US. So if I can add to that, because uh, I'm a portfolio manager uh, in the Canadian market of life settlements, and I would say the, uh, the return is very, uh, discount rate is very similar. But one of the things we did is we did a comparison at the request of uh, one of our MPPs. And uh, we, we, we looked at the IRR to us, and we know that's 13 to 15%. And then we looked at the IRR of the insurance company by having somebody lapse a policy. And it was more than double the IRR that we were using in our calculations. I will further add, we take a very conservative approach and we wanna make sure that at a conservative table that our return is in the right, well, we don't want it to be less than 7%. So as a conservative number, conservative life expectancy tables that we use, 7% is, is the number. And so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you all. Um, at this point, I don't think there's any more questions. So I wanna thank everyone for attending today. This was a great uh, discussion on uh, Bill 219. Uh, 
there will be a recording of today's event for other MPPs that did not attend. And if you'd like to look at the website uh, to see more about this policy on Bill 219, and I would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, have a great day.